Well, joining me now is former youth worker and current chair of the London Assembly's Police and Crime Committee, Sean Bailey. Delighted to have you on, Sean. Now, anybody who's been living in London, especially during lockdown, you can't turn a corner without smelling weed in the air. Is it time to just throw the towel in and say if we legalise it, at least we can regulate it? In a word, no. I'll give you three reasons. Firstly, if you believe that drug dealers are going to give up just because you can buy what will amount to menthol cigarettes in the chemist, you're wrong. Secondly, you'll be opening up the amount of people who are exposed to cannabis. So even if um, mental health rates stay the same, we could have a massive um, spike in the number of people who are negatively affected through the mental health situation. And of course, there's its link to crime. I grew up with a lot of people who sold drugs and even more people who smoked drugs. Now, most people can cope, but those who can't or those who turn to crime have a massive effect on us all. So in a word, absolutely not. But surely there's an argument here that if it becomes legalised, those people who are smoking it, who find they have problems with it, might be able to better access help to treat those problems, whereas if they think they're going to get in trouble because it's illegal, they might not. But also, surely, if it is legalised, then the government can in some way regulate the different levels of THC and CBD and make it a far more uh, anodyne product. Because if you legalise the good stuff, surely that's going to steer people away from the bad stuff. Because right now, you, you know, buying it on a no, street no. corner, you don't know what you're getting. No, no, no. You've got it the wrong way round. With drugs, the good stuff is the strong stuff, which is the bad stuff. The government, it, no government across the world has ha been able to say, OK, let's legalise the strongest cannabis. So if you're a regular user and you're watching this now, ask yourself, do you enjoy smoking skunk or do you enjoy smoking solid? And where do most of the people you know um, progress to, move on to? The government would, would have to give us some kind of soft, as I call it, menthol cigarette that was fairly safe. But people progress. Drugs are used to, you know, put you on your back, quite frankly. And, and, and a, a, a cannabis spiff that doesn't do that is a waste of time. And remember, I've been a youth worker for over 25 years. I saw so, so many young people throw away their potential. They weren't dangerous. They weren't involved in crime, but they weren't focused. They were just high as a kite the whole time. They went to bed at four and got up at four and life just passed them by. But, I mean, the, the, the problem is spiralling out of control in terms of the amount of usage. I mean, people are just brazenly blazing up everywhere, aren't they? When I walk to work, it's a 45-minute journey. I feel high by the time I get here, the amount of uh, cannabis fog I've walked through in places like Hyde Park. Well, actually, why don't we legalise burglary? There is tens of thousands of burglars in this country. Should we just give up and legalise? Of course we shouldn't. The amount of people who use cannabis relative to our societal numbers is actually very low. The number of people are negative, negatively affected is even lower. If we expand either of those two numbers, we're putting ourselves in a very dangerous light. Let's remember, the people who are saying let's legalise, they'll be the first ones to complain when the NHS can't cope with an influx of people who have psychosis brought on by, by cannabis. It is not clever to legalise just because a lot of people smoke. And I'll, I'll say this as well. I was a drug worker for a significant part of being a youth worker. People who have trouble with drugs know they can come forward and get help and continue to do that. Legalising that wouldn't change that situation. Legalising cannabis, although it seems like a soft and for some people sensible move, if you dig a little bit deeper, it's actually a very dangerous step. Well, surely, therefore, the police need to crack down on people smoking it, because if you were to lift someone up off the street who's, you know, sitting there smoking a joint in plain sight, and I see this all the time in London, and I've frankly seen it in my home city of Gloucester, so I'd imagine extrapolating, extrapolating out is happening everywhere. Surely you can drag them down to a police station, say, pass me the number of your dealer, and then you get to where you need to be. But that's not happening, I wish is it? I wish it was that simple. I really do. Drug dealers are a sophisticated bunch. You know, they're not stupid enough to let themselves be at risk because of the people who use. That's just not how it, how it works. And let's be clear, the police can't spend all of their time chasing people who are smoking weed. They are not c criminals, most of them, in the same way that we want the police to get people who are carrying knives. We want the police to get people who are burgling, who are doing antisocial behaviour. But this is where legalisation is a false argument. If you legalise, it doesn't mean that the police won't have to spend any time on it. Most, most of the time police spend dealing with drugs, it's not the smoking of drugs or even the selling of drugs. It's the crime it generates. People who steal, rob, burgle, commit fraud to pay for their habit. And if you legalise cannabis, it becomes a gateway drug. 
I used to work on a thing called the Crack Day Project. And one of the users said to me, not everybody who smokes cannabis will go on to smoke crack, but everybody who smokes crack started with cannabis. We've got to be careful about what we expose people to. If we think the problem is bad now, if we make the market that much bigger, that much easier to access, and that much less social stigma, then we could be in a real sticky situation. Now, I started off this programme an hour ago listing some of the countries that have taken the, the step of legalising or decriminalising uh, weed, and there are loads of them there, but to list a few, Australia, Austria, Canada, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Israel, Luxembourg, Malta, the Netherlands, Spain and Switzerland. Now, they are and 18 states in America. They're not crazy countries. It doesn't seem to me that their social fabric is collapsing and they've got people wandering around with serious mental health issues. So two things. Firstly, let's separate um, um, decriminalisation and legalisation. Very different thing. Let's look at has the level of crime risen directly linked to drugs and um, alongside drugs as well. And let's look at the mental health impact it's having. Now, there's studies all over the world that show if you legalise any drug, it, it, it speeds the uptake because price, everybody knows drug markets are largely regulated by price. If you lower the price, you get an uplift. If you lift the price up, you get less users. That's that sets a very important thing. If you look in London, if you look in Britain now, less young people smoke and drink because they are both relatively more expensive than they were in the past. If you legalize, you put a downward pressure on price. If you legalize, you put upward pressure on strength because everybody will be marketing. Everybody will want their, their product to stand out. And while all of this is going on, illegal drug markets at the very least will say the same, if not grow, because they won't be paying tax, they won't be paying advertising, and they will be providing the strongest substance on the street. Those nations have yet to look at the impact. I could tell you a number of nations who legalized other drugs who deeply, deeply regretted it. I don't think we should take that step. The international comparison isn't as straightforward as people have you believe, and would you like to roll the dice with everybody else's children? Well, good question, and uh, I'm not much of a gambler, I'm afraid, Sean, so I won't be rolling any dice. But thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure having thank you on you. the pleasure. programme. Joining me now is former Home Office Minister Norman Baker, who looked into legalisation when he was in government. Now, where did you get to on this? You must have heard what Sean has to say. He thinks legalising cannabis would just be, you know, the road to hell. Do you agree with that, or do you think actually we've got to the stage where it seems to be so prevalent, we may as well legalise it so we can control it and take it out of the hands of criminals? Yes, well, I mean, Sean's obviously very well motivated. I don't want to, to disagree with anything he said in terms of his motivation, but I think he's actually factually wrong in one or two matters. I did look into this in great detail. In fact, we commissioned, when I was Drugs Minister, we received a report on the international comparators of drug policy across the world. And what that demonstrated very clearly was that those countries which treated drug use as a health issue had less drug use and fewer problems than those who dealt with it very hard in, in terms of the, the law and penal policy. So Portugal, which has, has had for decades now one of the most uh, liberal regimes on drugs, actually had reduced its drug problem quite significantly as a consequence of its policy, whereas those countries which dealt with drug use, including cannabis use, very hard in a very hard manner, like Russia, ended up with uh, huge numbers of drug users. So, you know, the, the, the so-called war on drugs, which has been pursued for around 50 years now, really, across the Western world, simply hasn't worked. So that's, that's point one. Point two is that, uh, as you suggested in your questioning, it's perfectly possible to identify uh, strains of cannabis which are less harmful than others and to make those the ones which are legal. Look, let me give you a comparison with alcohol. You know, alcohol is legal in this country, but it's controlled by the government in terms of how it's manufactured, in terms of what's on the label, uh, in terms of the strength. Those things are all controlled. We don't, by and large, have a big market in illegal spirits, which we did have, by the way, in the States during the issue of prohibition, during the period of prohibition. There was all sorts of alcohol produced then, none of which was controlled, some of which is quite dangerous uh, and indeed deadly. We don't have a problem with illegal alcohol in this country in terms of strength. We have people smuggling legal alcohol from other countries into our country, but that's a different point altogether. So it's perfectly possible for the state to regulate a product, which is a drug, which it does with alcohol and tobacco, and for those products to be uh, controlled in terms of strength. What Uruguay has done, for example, has been to produce, uh, a, a, if you like, a state-controlled cannabis product, which is of a particular quality, and which people then have confidence in as a quality, and because people have confidence in the quality of it, 
and by and large, it's quite mild. It pushes people off the illegal market onto the legal market. And, and as you mentioned in the, your questioning as well, lots of states have gone down this particular road, and that is probably the way to go. But Sean has just said that people don't want to smoke the weak stuff. They want the good, strong stuff. They want the skunk. They want the hydroponically grown and genetically modified super skunk. Do you agree with that? Or do you think actually that in this country, if we were to legalise weed, regulate it and make sure that basically stuff that's fairly non-harmful is available, that that will actually alleviate pressure and make sure that, you know, cannabis users aren't buying things that could be really harmful, especially to their mental health? Yeah. Well, people, people don't go and try and find illegal alcohol and say, look, what's on, this, what's on the shelf? It's not good enough. I'm going to try and get some really dodgy stuff made somewhere else. They buy what's on the shelf. And the same would apply with, uh, with cannabis. I don't believe they behave, behave any differently to that. But what I do think is that there are some uh, materials which are smoked which are more dangerous than others. Skunk is actually, in my view, more dangerous than what used to be around in my youth, which was, which was grass predominantly or hash. And if we can get people back towards the less damaging varieties, I think you can get, frankly, you can get perfectly stoned on, on hash or on grass, and that's all you want to do. You don't have to have something which has got a more dangerous element to it. And the, the state can control what's in that product, and that's what it should do. And also, of course, let's not forget if cannabis were legalized, it would take a whole lot of time away from the police, who really shouldn't be pursuing people who are smoking weed and locking them up on some occasions in occupying prison places, but that still happened with people smoking weed. They could be spending more time on the burglaries that Sean is rightly concerned about, or on the dealers who are making life misery for people and cracking down on the really dangerous drugs which are immediately addictive, like crack cocaine. You know, that's where I want to see this, the police spend their time, not on a couple of guys on the park bench smoking a joint every now and then. In your view then, is, is legalizing weed acceptable? What about other drugs? Is it just weed or say grass and hash, the milder forms of um, weed? Is it appropriate to legalise those, but not other drugs? Well, I think you've got to look at this in the round, and, and uh, there may be other drugs which, which, frankly, pragmatically, not ethically necessarily, but pragmatically, you want to legalise because that's the best way of dealing with them, to have the state controlling it. And if you take the state into the, into the equation, first of all, you squeeze out some of the dealers, who therefore have got no reason to be there. But secondly, you raise money for the state. This is what you do by legalizing things like cannabis. And one of the reasons that some of the states in the U.S. have gone for legalization has been because it's a big income stream. That's extra money for the public purse, which is not going to the dealers, but going into the state coffers and can be used for good purposes, whether it's health or education or anything else for that matter. I mean, I was amazed to find that our cannabis grow, the legal cannabis growing industry, is set to be worth 2.3 billion by 2024. Yeah. That's in just this, just three years' time. And the biggest exporter of cannabis products is headquarters here. We, we are one of the biggest exporters. I mean, that that amazed me because we're incredibly um, defensive about even allowing cannabis related medical products onto the market. Are we, like, like you said, are we missing yeah. a trick here? We're definitely missing a trick. And also, I think it's been. It's obscene, to use that word. I, I'll use it um, deliberately. It's obscene to prevent people who've got medical conditions from receiving cannabis where cannabis treats those conditions effectively and where no other option is available. And I had deputations when I was the drugs minister from people who have got medical conditions who were helped by cannabis. And they weren't particularly called drug users. They were people desperately looking for, for some medical help. And they found that cannabis helped them. But it was illegal. Not only could they not access the medicine they required, but they were made into criminals if they did so. That cannot be right in a civilized society. They had to go to Holland and places to get their medicine. Now, surely in a civilized society, we can do better than that. And, but one of the consequences of, of the so-called war on drugs has been to make um, a medical substance illegal. You know, why have we got here? We got here because of the swinging 60s, because conservative small C politicians in the 1960s were horrified by youth suddenly taking up um, drug issues and Sergeant Pepper and all that sort of stuff in the 60s, they didn't understand. So what they did was they clamped down on it with the 1971 Misuse of Drugs Act. And that caused a whole lot of problems. For example, in the 1960s, heroin had been uh, prescribed by, to, to relatively few people by doctors who were keeping a tab on those few people who sadly uh, couldn't do without heroin. When it became illegal for doctors to do that in the 1970s, you know, all hell broke loose. 
and those people had to go underground. And that led to a huge explosion in heroin use as a consequence of that 1971 Act. So the attempts by Western governments over 50 years to clamp down on drugs have not only failed, they backfired. It's time to try something else. Well, my previous guest, Sean Bailey, who's actually was on the line still and heard, and heard what you had to say, Norman, actually wants to come back in. So let's, yeah. hear, let's hear his response to your argument. Sean, you, you've heard a bit of what Norman has to say. He disagrees with you that when it comes to things like the lightest forms of cannabis, things like, you know, just basic grass, those things are non-dangerous. And, and his view, and uh, he's looked into this extensively, is that by legalising that, actually you prevent people getting hooked on the strong stuff. Um, afternoon, Norman. I, I just have to disagree. I, I, I was born with a number of drug dealers, a number of drug users. It is a party drug. As you go on, you seek stronger and stronger and stronger. And if I'm wrong, somebody needs to answer the question, does, why does everybody pursue skunk then? There's much weaker forms of cannabis, but people have um, gone after spunk and skunk. Sorry, skunk exists because of its popularity. And also to compare it to alcohol is just simply, it's, it's, it's nonsensical. Alcohol is very difficult to produce and very difficult to dis distribute. Weed is not. You can grow weed in your garden. You can grow weed in your attic. You can grow weed in, in someone else's field. And because it's easy to produce and easy to distribute, ask the young people in London about county lines, they'll tell you as much. It isn't quite the same comparator. Now, I do agree that that forceful hard clampdown doesn't always work. That's why I said you have to make the difference between legalization and, and, and non-criminalization, there's, there's a conversation to be had there potentially. But the idea, and this is my thing, particularly poor communities are going to respond to lovely menthol cigarettes regulated by the government, I'm afraid it simply isn't true. And, and there's a real big difference here between how a, a well-established middle-class person with a job and lots to lose smokes their weed and how children from poor communities get in contact with weed. And that, for me, means I sh we shouldn't take the risk. So, Norman, I mean, you heard what Sean had to say. Are we essentially assuaging the polite middle classes who might fancy a doobie after a dinner party uh, at the altar of sacrificing, you know, hard-up young kids who could end up with drugs problems? Well, I mean, a lot of kids... I mean, you know, I've been on the streets too, quite frankly, when I was drugs minister, as you'll appreciate, Sean, and, and people will buy what's available for what's pushed by the dealers. And quite often these days, as you'll know, dealers are pushing skunk, they're not pushing other varieties. So it's not a question of choice, it's a question of what's there. That's part of the problem we've got. But look, I mean, the fact is that we've got an epidemic, if you want to call it an epidemic, of drug use in this country. Uh, we've got an epidemic of cannabis use, if you want to call it an epidemic. So nothing that's, worked, nothing that's tried so far has done anything to reduce drug use. It's only increased drug use. So, you know, that's, that's where you've got to start from. You've got to start from that position. I'm not particularly in favour of drug use. You know, I don't think, I think it's a better world if people didn't use drugs, including alcohol. By the way, alcohol kills about 20,000 people a year. This is a parliamentary answer. Um, tobacco kills about 50,000 people a year. Cannabis kills about three, not 3,000, about three. So if we're going to deal with deaths. But, but, but Norman, is it interesting... Isn't it interesting that only one of those three things that is illegal is cannabis? So the argument that yeah. legalising will reduce deaths, well, you look at the two legal um, substances you quoted, and they have massive amounts of deaths, and the real thing is, is because they're available. And here's the thing, Norman, you talk about a lack of choice and availability. Yeah. If your local drug dealer can sell you skunk cheaper yes. than the chemist, and the government can send you, sell you whatever they want to sell you, which will you buy? The choice is often about price, and a drug dealer who doesn't have to market, doesn't have to pay taxes, will always beat the legal cost, always. Well, look, I mean, alcohol is really cheap. Alcohol, in my view, is too cheap in, when in supermarkets. You can buy, as you know, strong lager and strong vodka in the supermarket, but next to nothing, and, and, and cheaper than water. It's sometimes cheaper than bottles of water. So that's so the price is available if you want to look at it in those terms. But, you know, I went to this... Um, drug clinic when I was drugs minister down in um, Kensington. And when I went down there, I expected to find a whole lot of heroin addicts. Uh, what, what did I find? Alcoholics. And when I was told yeah. by the, the people who worked there that, um, that alcohol was more of a problem for them than heroin was, that because that's, that's the way it works. I've dealt with people who've been addicted to heroin. Dare I say, Charles Kennedy, uh, to, uh, uh, alcohol. Charles Kennedy, for example, in my own party, who sadly died really as a consequence of alcohol. Alcohol is a terrible drug. Norman, Norman, um, Norman. You know, it's, it's, we let that go. We let that go. It's, uh, Norman, it's everywhere. Norman. It's, it's on television. It's in radio. It's everywhere. No, Norman, it's not that I verbally disagree with you. I get that the, uh, governments worldwide have spent all kinds of money fighting drugs in the wrong way. 
but legalizing is wrong. And I can tell you that alcohol is a big problem because my own brother died of alcoholism. I know what yeah. alcohol does. And the yeah. point about alcohol, it is not socially unacceptable. We celebrate no, right. it. It is cheap and freely available. Wouldn't yeah. you be doing yeah. just the same thing if you legalized marijuana? That oh. is my worry. Unfortunately for me, I've grown up in a sea of people who've had marijuana affect their life. And in this conversation, we didn't really touch on the mental health aspect of it as well, which affects you no matter no. where. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favorite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.